when you sell a beat to a major record label, things get a little crazy because they issue you a pretty long and intimidating contract. And a lot of producers, a lot of beat makers are afraid of these contracts and they should be, I'm just playing. Let's expose a couple so you know what to expect when a record label inevitably offers you a deal for one of your beats. It's gonna happen, we're manifesting it right here. Now, what I don't want you to do is watch this video and think that this serves as legal advice. Don't watch this video and then go and represent yourself if a label offers you a, a producer agreement. Get a lawyer, but I hope to familiarize you with some of the major points in a contract so you can communicate with your lawyer, you can ask the right questions, you can assist, you can be an active participant in the negotiations because otherwise, if you're not, if you're just sitting back letting the lawyer do whatever they do, you don't know if they're doing right by you, you don't know if it's a good deal, you don't really know much of anything until eventually you realize you signed a deal that wasn't that favorable. That's how I feel about my first deal. I didn't like the way my lawyer essentially just signed off on it, didn't redline, didn't negotiate, didn't do anything, and just after the fact, basically told me to eat it. This is a agreement that I received a long time ago. It says 2002, it was not 2002. I was a kid in 2002. This is actually the first draft. I couldn't find a PDF version of the final draft of this. I think I just have it printed out and I was too lazy to scan it. So this is for when I worked on the games album Jesus piece. And this is a very typical producer agreement. I'm going to show you a second one um, with a different record label. This is from Interscope, as you can see. I'm going to show you one from Def Jam. I could make a million videos, a million podcast episodes about these producer agreements in every individual piece. And I would have a lawyer with me because I am not a lawyer. I'm not a stupid person, but this is far above my pay grade. And so I'm not going to sit here and break down every individual stipulation here. You know, you have to provide the label, the files, you have to do that, you know, they're talking about 24 track master tapes. This isn't really relevant to, to the way um, file delivery exists in, in, in 2023. Yeah, a bunch of stuff where you agree that, you know, you're not going to screw anyone over, that you own all this stuff. When I talk to lawyers, I've interviewed a couple on here and I've asked a couple of them, hey, which what are the what are the main points to look out for as a producer when you're reviewing your contract? One is the advance. The other is the underlying composition split. Thirdly, royalty points. I'm, I'm going to talk about more than those three, uh, but those are kind of the big three. Not to say that there aren't other important elements of a producer agreement. Again, this isn't, this isn't legal advice, but let's go back very quickly. I know you saw this coming. This is important. So when you sell a beat to a record label, they are purchasing this. A lot of people hear the term work for hire and they run for the hills. They think, okay, I'm about to get screwed. I should not ever sign a work for hire. Virtually all producer agreements with a record label are work for hire contracts. That means you are transferring the rights of the sound recording to the label, but you are still retaining the rights to the underlying composition. And that's important because there are, as you can see, many royalty streams that you are owed. Oh, see all these? You are these many royalty streams that you are owed. Not to say that you're not um, owed royalty streams here, but I'm going to explain to you why you might not get many of those in, in most cases. So here is where work for hire appears, right? And they're talking about the masters specifically. Right here, you can see excluding the underlying musical compositions therein, excluding the underlying musical compositions there. And this is important because you know the label is not buying out your underlying composition. Therefore, you should be receiving a fair split, which means equity in the underlying composition, which means you will get your writer split and your publisher split. And that means you can receive or you are entitled to receive performance royalties, mechanical royalties, money from sinks, um, micro syncs as well via, uh, via YouTube, which aren't um, displayed on this particular chart, but uh, that is a royalty stream that falls under the underlying composition umbrella. Let's find out these royalties. 3% royalty rate. Now, a lot of people get confused. This is um, also phrased as three points in a lot of contracts. 3% is standard. Again, 
I'm showing you what's a, what a standard major label producer agreement looks like. I'm not telling you that I agree with every single term. I don't. I actually think a lot of these, these stipulations should be changed. And maybe I'll inject my opinion, but I don't want to make a super long opinion-based video. I just want to focus on the facts. These are actual agreements that I've gotten straight from record labels. So what standard usually is 3%. Now, I've discussed my very first agreement ever and that was the one that my lawyer didn't do a damn thing on. He didn't negotiate at all, right? So I had the 3% royalty rate, which is standard. However, there should have been a point bump. And I, it looks like there's actually not a point bump because this was the first draft. I'm going to show you another contract that reflects a point bump. This is for the beat that I produced for Ludacris and Rick Ross off Ludacris' last album. And here we are. 3% base rate, but you'll see there is a point bump to three and a half, which, oh my God, wow, three and a half. Once it hits a million, so when it goes platinum, my rate goes up. When it hits two, then my rate goes up to 4%. That should have actually been in place in my first agreement. It should have been better than this. It should have been three, then like three and a half for gold, then four for platinum, and then like five for multi-platinum because it did go platinum, so that would have helped me out back to the actual advance where is the event here we go here's the advance fully recoupable but non-returnable now here is a part of the contract that will scare a lot of people when you sell a beat to a major label and they give you an advance or if you're a rapper and you sign to a major label and you get an advance there's this narrative out there that you have to pay that advance back and if you don't pay that advance back it's just like a loan now that's terrifying because if you've ever defaulted on a loan, you know what happens. The bill collectors come after you. They're asking for interest. You may have only borrowed $10,000. Now you owe $25,000, $35,000. It, it's crazy. And it just keeps going up and up. And they're harassing you and they're garnishing your wages. So people are naturally and rightfully scared to accept in advance because they think that's what's going to happen. I even Googled it just to see what resources are there. And on this website, <laughs> look. Just read this. This is terrifying. Typically, artists can do whatever they want with advances. Some use it to fund tours and promote albums. Others may use it to buy a mansion or luxury car or a chain, which is what I did. No matter what the money is spent on, the most important thing to understand about a record label advance is that the money must eventually be paid back to the label. Must. You see that word? Must. Must be paid back. This is fucking terrifying. In this regard, advances can be thought of as a loan. I don't know what this website is, but I know they're trying to sell you a course. Now, when I go to a law office's website, here's the question. Does the artist have to pay back the record company for the money they lost in the deal? I.e., if you are given an advance, do you have to pay that advance back if the album flops or if you, know, if you get a, a, an advance on a beat and um, it doesn't recoup? Because that's what we're talking about. We're talking about recoupment. And if that is the case, you think, oh, oh my God, I oh, everyone said uh, uh, advance is just like a loan. Do I owe the label all this money? No, you don't. No. And they even add, if the contract you are offered suggests that you have to pay back the label if the record is not successful, you're not dealing with a reputable company, okay? I am not a fan of this narrative that a record label advance is a loan because let's, let's just look at what a loan is. When you receive an actual loan, over time, you have to pay this amount back, the principal, with interest. You don't have to pay anything back when you take a, a, an advance from a label. And that's why I appreciate here, it says non-returnable advance, just so I'm not pissing on myself because this particular album didn't go platinum. And so it didn't recoup. What, what am I talking about when I'm talking about recoupment? Well, here's another, we'll go back to the ludicrous agreement. Also $10,000 advance, selling beats online, tight beats, all that. They didn't kill five figure advances. They still exist. And I'm just DJ Payne one. I'm not, I'm, I'm not Timberland. I'm not Metro. I'm not uh, ATL Jacob. They talk about recoupment. The producer advance shall be recoupable by you for monies payable to the producer here under the producer agreement to the extent not so recoup such sums may be recouped by you from any record royalties becoming payable to the artist excluding mechanical royalties so they can't touch those because those fall under the underlying composition copyright that's why i say that chart that i always show you is so important because it it 
clarifies so much. Recoupment, this is where I start having a problem with the way record label advances work. Because if you're buying the master from me, it shouldn't be recoupable, in my opinion. You get the master, give me my 10,000, and then you can start paying me with your whole convoluted point system. Because that 3%, it's not 3% of what the, the album makes. It's not even 3% of what the label makes after marketing. It's 3% of what the artist is getting, which is already a reduced percentage, plus all the stuff that they're recouping against you. So can I even tell you what that is? No, I would have to hire um, a lawyer to audit the label. And you know, that's thousands of dollars just to figure out why the label hasn't sent you thousands of dollars. So that part becomes just a, a total racket. The label paid me the $10,000 for the beat, right? So I'm already sitting at negative 10,000. It doesn't mean I have to pay them back 10,000. It means that in order for me to get paid any more from the royalties generated from that particular song or album or both, then that 10,000 needs to be recouped by the label at a rate that I would say is unfair. Because if the label makes back a million dollars, I'm only getting credit for 3% of 16% of that for recoupment. So it's really convoluted. That's why a lot of producers, especially if you produce on an album that you know doesn't go five times platinum or you produce a song that's just an album cut and not a hit single, that's why a lot of producers never see additional money from the label. They might see money from the mechanical royalties, which can be paid out through the label. They can see money through performance royalties. They can see money through sinks. So there are a lot of um, income stream. It's just that this particular income stream, the master royalties, sound recording royalties, especially nowadays, they're not, they're not really all that abundant because of the way these deals are structured and have pretty much always been structured. Another thing that's interesting is um, the sound exchange thing. Now, the problem with sound exchange is, well, it's confusing. It falls underneath the master recording umbrella and it's paid out through digital radio. What's confusing is that these are non-interactive streams, right? Spotify is generally thought of as, as interactive streams and so they pay performance royalties, but something like Pandora, if you're just listening and it's randomly playing songs for you, you're not actually selecting them yourselves, then that is considered a non-interactive stream and it's paid out through sound exchange it says us only sound exchange is actually a governmental creation the u.s government created sound exchange and what's problematic about sound exchange is that contracts and this is something to to make sure that that is a part of your producer agreement they require an lod a letter of direction and so you'll see that that's attached as an exhibit at the end of this agreement. Here it is. Here's a sound exchange letter of um, direction. If that's not there, then you're probably not even getting registered. And this is something that labels should include, but if they don't, then your, your lawyer will want to make a point of bringing that up. So I think what's really important, I, if I may just share my opinion, when you get an advance, just think like that might be the only money you're getting off of a project. I hope that's not the case, but if it is, don't think, okay, I just got 10,000. Let me just blow this because there's more coming. There might not be more coming. So if you can invest in something that's actually going to create more opportunity for you to generate additional revenue, I would encourage you to do that. I'm not saying don't spend a thousand of it at the strip club. Do whatever you want, but maybe don't spend all 10,000. Maybe don't spend all 10,000 doing something like Bottle Wars, which is stupid, but that's just my opinion. Yes, I, I bought a chain with my first events, but I also bought a new computer and that computer helped me create additional revenue. For example, that computer that I purchased with my very first advance was the computer on which I made the beat for both contracts I showed you here. So that computer helped generate me an additional $20,000. And my very first advance was only $4,000. So I don't regret my decisions. I think that was a smart decision. The other thing is I learned after my first agreement that I needed to check, not in a disrespectful way, I just needed to check in on my lawyer. Granted, my first lawyer was an industry lawyer. I didn't have a good relationship with him. Subsequently, I had a lawyer that I did have a good relationship with, and I could just call her on the phone and we could talk things through, talk through agreements, get on the same page. And if I didn't understand something, she would agree, uh, explain it to me. That's the kind of 
attorney-client relationship, I hope for all of you. But in the meantime, I encourage you to learn about these terms, about recoupment, about advances, about point bumps, just maybe even download a, a sample agreement from some website, just Google it, I'm sure they exist. If there's a term that's unfamiliar to you, research it. Not so that you can represent yourself. Please don't represent yourself. We've seen what happens when, when producers represent themselves. They miss one, one thing, next thing you know, they, they realize a year later that they've signed a buyout. It happens. It's better to know as much as possible, even though you have a very qualified, competent attorney representing you. It's better to know more. It's better to know what they're doing. It's better to understand the terms that they're presenting you because they should be communicating with you and say, here, this is the initial offer. You know, call me if you have questions and you can say, yeah, I don't like this. I think the point bump should be higher. I think the advance should be higher, you know, whatever. The, the lawyer can only do so much. You, you also have to contribute to that negotiation. So, so if that was helpful, let me know if there's anything else you want me to cover in these agreements. Also let me know. And I appreciate you watching and, and I hope you get a ton of these contracts very shortly in your career. And then you ask me for my cash app because you watched this video and it was super helpful. Appreciate you for tuning in. Thank you.